<laughs> I would like to begin um, by also acknowledging uh, my, um, Adam and I, the Gadigal people, um, on whose land this gallery stands, and acknowledge that the gallery has named its Yurubana Gallery in honour of those people whose uh, custodianship of this country continues today. So, and to our elders past and present, and thank you to all of you, so many of you, who have turned out tonight. It's great to see you all here. And I know that you've all come to see me. Um, <laughs> um, well, um, I'm not nervous at all. I am, um, as I get comfortable here, I manage to forget my reading glasses. Um, and have, Amanda's kindly loaned me some of those. So. Um, Otherwise, it was going to be Adam reading and answering the questions. Um, so that would be entertaining. <laughs> um, anyway, just and personally for me, Adam, thank you so much for your support. And um, we're, we're so grateful to have you as part of Corroboree Sydney. And, of course, your very close friend and cousin, Michael O'Loughlin, who also has supported uh, Corroboree in, in helping us get the word out. So we are indebted to you, and, and thank you very much. So... Michael has already given us a very brief um, summary of your many achievements, and I'm just going to say them again because they're really awesome. So the two premierships, the two Brownlow medals, the f you are a four-time All-Australian and a member of the Indigenous team of the century, and I think that we could say that that team would be not only a football team, just team full stop, so you are amazing. And of course, um, in, as uh, Michael again said, you have, in an astonishingly short period of time, I think, did you say you've been in Sydney for 18 years only? Yeah, for 17 years. It'll be 18 years next year. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, in that time, uh, you've become a domestic violence awareness ambassador, worked with kids in detention centres, and, of course, with your fellow Swanee and legendary uh, cousin, Michael, you've established the Go Foundation. So that's amazing. And, of course... Australian of the Year. So not bad for a kid from Port Pirie. <laughs> but I, I was thinking to myself, um, you know, knowing you're such a down-to-earth and, and humble fella, that um, one of the things that probably makes you most proud is how proud you've probably made your mum. Because um, I know she told you, when, wasn't she, when you were joining the draft, she put you on the bus or was it, into town and said, bring me home a Brownlow, and you've done it twice. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's the same person who keeps me grounded as well, because um, if I ever get too big or keep acting like a big shot, she's the first one to knock me down, so uh, she's definitely been the, the person who's helped drive me, but um, also the person that's um, always been there to uh, pick me up when things aren't going too well as well. Mm. Yeah, that's what mothers are for. Um, no, it's, it's, it's amazing. You can sort of really see that, I think, that uh, you've got that strong, you know, strong support, unstinting support, but also someone that can really just say, mate, you've done the wrong thing, and you, you've said in a number of your um, public statements that, you know, we all make mistakes, but it's how you address those mistakes or, you know, what you learn from them that's a test of a man or a woman. Yeah, definitely. I, I came to Sydney when I was 17, and, um, you know, I wasn't always this confident. I, always, I didn't know... Um, you know, what I know now and that knowledge is the key to why I am confident and proud of who I am. Um, this knowledge wasn't passed on to me um, as soon as I was born. It's something that I've had to learn over my years being in Sydney and um, my personal journey that I've been on to find out where my ancestors come from and who I am as an Aboriginal person has, has definitely helped um, shape the way that I live my life and, and it definitely helps um, the way that I lead whether that's on the football field or off the football field. Mm. So if we were to sort of rewind a bit before the accolades, you know, the start rolling in, I mean, I was thinking, well, there's an obvious analogy, you know, being a swanee uh, with the story of the ugly duckling that turns into a swan, but, of course, the ugly duckling bit would have never applied to you. Um, and, uh, but your story is a bit of a rags-to-riches kind of story, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, you know, my family, we didn't have a lot growing up. Um, grew up in housing commission um, housing, went to public schools. I went to six different public schools. Um, unfortunately, we moved around quite a fair bit uh, because of family reasons. Um, mum was taken out of her home when she was five, so um, mum was always on this journey herself to reconnect with her nine brothers and sisters. So 
we were moving everywhere around South Australia until um, we found home in uh, country Victoria, which was, which was nice to finally find a place um, to settle down for three years as it was, um, enough time for me to, to finish high school and, and um, you know, get drafted to the Sydney Swans at 17. But, you know, we definitely didn't have a lot, but what we did have was each other. You know, I had a mum that uh, made a lot of sacrifices, a lot of personal sacrifices for what she wanted um, for her boys. And um, to have two younger brothers that I'm very proud of and what they've been able to achieve in their lives up to this stage is is quite rewarding and, you know, there's only one person to thank for that and that's our mum. Yeah, that's lovely. Tribute. That's beautiful. I know my kids are here, so I hope they're taking note of all of this. <laughs> Brownlow medals and the rest. Um, <laughs> but um, I've, in the process, when I was, uh, Adam accepted this invitation to be part of this conversation with all of us, I thought, well, let's make it with all of us and, and invited people on Facebook if they wanted to ask some questions. And so I've got a few of those interspersed with my own. Um, and Christian Thompson, who's an artist, uh, he, he said this sort of leads off from what you're saying. He, he watched the episode of Where Do I Come From? And um, he was moved to tears and he said, it, it struck me what a compassionate, warm and generous person you are. And can you tell us about where you think that comes from for you? And how do you think your perceptions of your own history and your own experience changed your life or the way that you, you, you know, go about things every day? Yeah, that, that journey I went on was only last year and we spent three weeks filming over in South Australia and getting to know my ancestry and finding out. Um, my actual background is I'm up Namatna, Narunga and Naradri, um, which is three different tribes in South Australia, but I only knew 12 months ago that I was up Namatna, but I didn't know how I was up Namatna. So to go on that journey um, to find out all these things about my ancestry was such a very personal and it was a great way to share it with my family, but also with the, the rest of Australia who watched it. But um, growing up, um, my mum left my dad when I think I was eight um, and I pretty much was brought up by my mum and five or six aunties. So I didn't really have that strong male figure in my family until probably high school and um, so that compassion and that empathy that I have I think definitely comes from my aunties and the women that are in my life um, and who continue to be in my life and, and show me that compassion and that you know we all do make mistakes and you can learn from that um, and you know I really got that um, male influence from teachers at school and, and football coaches who really took it upon themselves to really be that strong male figure in my life and help you know, with the discipline and the laziness that I was as a, as a young kid. <laughs> well, we're all guilty of that, I think. I mean, I, was, I think um, it was that Roos was saying how, um, how hard you've worked to earn these accolades, you know, actually knocking on the door and saying, what can I do to, to get, you know, up the ranks of best and fairest or whatever. He really talks a lot about that, doesn't he? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, for me, I didn't know I wanted to be a professional athlete until a year after I'd been in Sydney and um, growing up I wanted to be an architect um, you know I did all my studies to, to become a, an architect and on my last day of the English exam I got drafted as a 17 year old to come to Sydney to play footy and um, I was living up here for a year that I, I really committed to the idea that I'm going to be away from my family for a long period of time um, I'm going to give this a, um, all that I can and to do that you know I had to get better and, and, and that's the way I see every year of my life is that I can keep improving, I can keep in, help, peeping, help people around me keep improving as well and if I think me as one of the oldest players in the AFL and one of the oldest players in my football club, if I can keep improving year in and year, year out on and off the field, the younger players will see that, other people will see that and you know, hopefully that um, inspires people that they can still improve in, in different areas of their lives as well. Mm. Do you think, um, I mean, sport has always been seen, I think, by members of our community, Indigenous community and, and others, I, I assume, as a way out of a cycle of disadvantage. And was that, was, was that your feeling or, or do you think that's still the case, being a good sportsman or woman? Yeah, I think um, it's an option, that's for sure. It's, it's a great option. It's, it's not a good option because, you know, there's only 650 um, spots on AFL lists every year and... You know, <coughs> with, with, what are we, 23 million people here in Australia, I think we're about 480,000 Indigenous people. So to 
keep narrowing those numbers down into 650 jobs. That's not many and it's not a, a great option. So the things that we're teaching our young Indigenous players from a very young age is that, yeah, football's the dream and, and, and it is something to really strive towards, but you need other things going on in your life. You need an education. You need to go to university because you need something to fall back on. Not every player gets to play 350 games and, and win a couple of premierships. You know, my career is 0.0025% of people in Australia that get to do that. So it's very rare for that to happen. So we're really trying to skill these kids up these days about other opportunities that you can get from football. And there's so many different levels of football that you can play that can give you opportunities outside of that to do um, better things in your life. Mm. Um, did you ever feel that, well, did you have a moment when you thought, you know, people say, well, sport and politics doesn't mix and, and it's similarly about art and politics. But I've always felt that, you know, in my work that there's been the political element. It's intrinsically political just being, you know, an Indigenous person working in, in this country today. And recently you'll know, of course, that Tony Albert, um, the North, far North Queensland artist, won the Basil Sellers Prize with a work, um, Once Upon a Time, that was about, about you um, and, and a tribute to you. So do you, was there a moment when you thought, um, you know, s sport and politics should mix or was it something that you'd always had in your mind? Oh, I definitely didn't have it in my mind. I think I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. Um, being here tonight and having these people listen to me talk tonight, they're here for a reason and so am I. So it's a great opportunity for me to tell people about who I am and what, what I choose to do outside of football. And um, the politics side, it really was something that I had no idea about. I really didn't know much about government. Um, I was asked at 23 to sit on the National Indigenous Council for John Howard as an advisory committee. And for that three years that I sat on that council, I got a really great idea on how government works, um, how hard it is to get things done in government, especially for Aboriginal policies. And for me, um, that really gave me a great idea to work with government, but also to do my own thing with my own money that I earn to help help people because at least that way um, I can choose what we what we want to do with that money and um, just on um, the award um, on, on Albie up there in Queensland it was a fantastic um, piece that he did and if people haven't seen it um, definitely look it up it's a, a, a fantastic piece on um, you know little micro figures of, of me um, <laughs> which is pretty cool <laughs> I didn't think anyone could do that and be so creative, but it was quite an amazing piece. Yes, I didn't even know those. I, I know the artist and was at the studio when he was making the work, and yeah, every day he was getting little eBay packages of little tiny Adam Goods figures. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, I mean, one of the things that have inevitably happens, I guess, when you're a public figure and when you uh, um, mix it up a bit, the sport and the politics is that you you do become a vulnerable or you open yourself up to um, you know criticism let's call it that's a polite word for some of it um, and I guess recently there's this there's, oh, there's this term that's come up called you know lateral violence and then that's often you know these kind of quite malicious attacks that can be made on public figures and um, and I know there's an opposing movement called lateral love but how do you how do you deal with that sort of kickback, I guess, that you get from, from members of our, you know, our own communities, um, but also our, you know, the wider communities? Is it something you're dealing with tackling directly? Yeah, you do. I, I think, obviously, you don't take it too personally because um, if you did, you know, I, I probably would lock myself in my room and never come out and, and be too shy to even want to say anything out there ever again. But I think people just have to take what I say as this is my opinion. You know, I'm representing myself when I say these things and you know it's up for people then to decide whether or not they agree with it or disagree and if they disagree or agree let's have the conversations that's what it is about for me and with the lateral violence you know it is it is hard and it's for me it's easy to deal with because I'm criticized every training session every time I play football um, by my friends my family by my coaches by my teammates so that's something that I'm used to mm. I can take criticism I can accept it I can move on pretty quickly. A lot of people out there can't do that and the lateral love concept is, is, is a fantastic concept that we should love each other, we should celebrate each other and 
Um, we shouldn't be nasty and pick on each other at our, our, our small flaws that we might have or something silly that we said because um, we waste too much time being negative that if we keep the positiveness going, then um, you know, it can make a lot of change a lot quicker. Mm, yeah, that's very true. Um, with one, I guess one of the um, subjects that you've be become out uh, as, a, as a champion of is the Recognise uh, campaign. And of course that's one that you know, people have divided opinions about. Do you want, can you tell us about why you, do you support that as, uh, as you just said earlier about being it's your own views or do you feel that you're representing a, a, the community when you support that um, idea? Yeah, I think the, 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 the best thing about Recognise for me and um, why I, I am so strong um, supporting the, the campaign is that, you know, the Aboriginal history unfortunately isn't great and um, I see it as a great opportunity for us as Australians to do something about it now to rewrite history in a way. We can't rewrite the, the wrongs that have been done but what we can do is set the rights going forward and the Recognise campaign is about getting constitutional recognition for Aboriginal people into you know, our founding document. And for me, that we're not in there, you know, it is a shame and it's disappointing, but we as Australian, if we um, get this recognised campaign up to a referendum, we have a, a great opportunity to, to change the history, to really be the, the people of 2000 and whatever the year might be, that we set the record straight and, and got that change in the constitution. And, and that for me, um, and, and why I, I get out there and say it to the people is a lot of people don't feel like they have an opportunity to change what's happened to Aboriginal people in the past, to say sorry, but this is a real opportunity for people going forward that I voted yes that day to include Aboriginal people in the constitution and that for me is why I'm out there um, pushing the envelope and, and hoping people that agree with it and then people who don't agree with it then ask yourself, why, why don't I agree with it? And, and find out what we're trying to change in the Constitution. Hmm. <laughs> well, that, that sort of leads into another question from uh, members of the public. And most of these questions are from queries, you know. Um, because apparently you're going to become Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> or president, maybe. We haven't even gone there with the whole Republican movement. But um, So, when you're Prime Minister, um, what will you do differently for Aboriginal people? Like, one positive thing. So, and the person said, look, you know, we're not asking you to change the world, but what would be the first thing that you would like to do? We don't have to pay tax. <laughs> Just you or everyone? <laughs> everyone, everyone. <laughs> Free money. Um, oh, I think you're going to get voted in. Should we, we, we should get an election. <laughs> I think the biggest thing for me and, um, you know, education is the key for us and for the people that know a lot about Aboriginal history and, and the journey I've been on learning about Aboriginal history, that for me, um, you know, I'm very jealous of the, the New Zealand people and, and, and the way that, you know, they have treaty, they, they have language and all people that live in New Zealand have language and they have that attachment to the culture of the Maori people and that for me is something that I dream of happening in Australia that every person that you meet on the street you say oh where are you from and they, they might say the town that they're from but then they'll say the Aboriginal word that mm. um, represents the, the mob where they come from so you know getting education of Aboriginal history into the schools and and really giving people opportunity to decide themselves on, you know, this is what happened to Aboriginal people. Yeah, I do empathise with, you know, the leaders out there that are trying to get change for their people and um, hopefully that's something that government will do anyway because, you know, there are talks of changing the education system which is fantastic but it's definitely something that I would love to, to change straight away and, and give everyone in Australia that, that opportunity to connect with Aboriginal people and, and our culture because it is a sharing culture, you know, we, we're very inclusive with our, our culture and, and we do want to share it with everyone. Mm. So what would you say to someone who, who regards, and I'm not thinking of any one person in particular, that regards this kind of, uh, you know, looking at the history of Australia in an honest and open way and moving forward with that, what would you say to them who, if they said it was a, a black armband history? 
Yeah, look, it's, it's unfortunate. People have their opinions and that's fine. And, you know, I'm mainstream blackfella. There's different levels of blackfellas going around and there's different levels of everybody else out there in the culture. And that's fine. That's what makes Australia so great. I love how multicultural we are. And we're not telling people that you have to learn this and have to learn that. For me, it's about actually teaching the history in all schools so everybody knows it and then they can decide how they feel about it. Um, with your comment about the black arm history, like for me, um, our history, you know, there's some good things and there's a lot of bad things. And for me, after learning it, you know, I got past being angry all the time. I actually want to start doing something positive and create that change now for our people and, and for the people in the community because if I was angry and I was up here being angry, you know, there might be half the people in the room right now because we don't want to see that anger. We want to see how can we move forward together and hopefully um, with me being out there talking about this and, and being um, passionate about the causes, then hopefully that helps just a little bit. But on the flip side, people are right to have their opinions, to still be angry, to still not want to celebrate Australia Day because they are still hurting and um, they haven't um, you know, dealt with what, what's happened to them and their families. Mm. And is that, well, I mean, I think you've probably answered the question, but um, is that why you accepted the honour of being uh, Australian of the Year? And, and, and how do you feel about that? Do, what, why do you think you were asked, if it is an invitation, I don't know if it's an invitation or a competition, but why do you think you were given, awarded that very significant honour? And, and mm. Yeah, I was nominated uh, by a few people um, in New South Wales for the New South Wales Australian of the Year, and um, I accepted that award, and, and part of winning that award, you then go into the Australian of the Year awards. And um, so at no point did I have any control of whether I was going to get the award or not. So um, you know, I was just very grateful that people out there in the community that have never met me recognise the work that I do um, and they see that as a positive thing for our community. So um, I have to thank those people for nominating me because they're, they're feeling that influence that I'm doing and that I am doing good things to, to help our communities um, reconcile, which, which is great. So um, it was a great honour to, to accept Australian of the Year Award and what it's done for the last you know, 10 months for me is give me a, a great platform to, to talk about the things I'm passionate about and to do you know, um, things like this tonight, which I might not have got the opportunity to do um, mm. beforehand. I think, yeah, Australian of the century should probably be the one. Does, um, it, <laughs> but you'd be worn out, wouldn't you? I mean, it's been a pretty hectic year, hasn't it? <laughs> it has been a hectic year, but it's like I, th I feel like I've been in practice for it. You know, I've been really busy off the field with football, and one thing that I've been really good at is, is having balance. And when I have balance across my football, my social, and all the, the work that I do outside of football, I'm just happy. And mm. the things that I talk about, they don't tire me, they're things that I'm passionate about, so they actually energise me to get out there and keep doing it. So what do you do to chill out, to use the cool <coughs> way of speaking about it? Do you um, <laughs> kick back, as the kids would say? Yeah, I'd, actually, people might find this quite funny. I like to do puzzles, so I got these uh, 2,000... Jigsaw puzzles? Or? Yeah, jigsaw puzzles. Oh. I got these 2,000 uh, <laughs> piece Mate. puzzles that I... <laughs> try and do every year. I start them in uh, mm. March, January every year. Usually takes me to the end of football season to finish and if you come to my house you have to at least contribute one bit of the oh, puzzle so yeah. it's, it's one of those things that I try and get everyone involved in because uh, <laughs> the outsides are pretty easy but once you get in the middle it gets pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'm a bit of an edge, uh, edge part but I, do, I love a jigsaw puzzle yeah. so I'm on the same page. You, I won't be putting one piece in, I'll be there <laughs> until the end of the year, until it's done. So just a warning, don't invite me over. Um, <laughs> no, that's, that's very interesting. So when you got Australian of the Year, just uh, we won't talk about it all night, but um, so what did, what did Mum say? Was she, that wasn't on her list of things to bring home, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> and um, she was there sitting in the crowd and I could see once I was up on stage and accepted the award that she was just bawling her eyes out. And oh. it was... Uh, you know, I, I try to put myself in, in her shoes, you know, um, you know, how would I feel if that was my son or daughter up there? And it, it is just a, just overwhelming for, for mum. And um, I think she thinks, she doesn't take 
a lot of credit for, for me being who I am. She thinks um, it's a lot of my doing and a lot of the football club up in here in Sydney. I've lived half my life up here in Sydney now and um, I always tell her, no, no, the things you taught me and brothers and other family members are the reason why we are like this mum. You need to take credit for that and accept that you've done a, an amazing job with us three boys by yourself. So. Yeah, yeah, no, good on her, good on her. What, what, We'll have to invite her up next time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, no, that, that's, that's, um, that's lovely for you to acknowledge, you know, obviously acknowledge that and pay tribute to her. And um, we all thank her, I think. You could pass on that to, <laughs> to oh, yeah, her for the you. good job she's done. Um, so we probably should talk about the Swans. Um, we should probably talk about the grand final. <laughs> no, no, no. Michael Brand wants to talk about the grand final. Where is he? Um, this isn't a question from me. This is because I, I put the mocker on team. So if I if I pay attention to any team and how it's doing, they inevitably go sideways. So I've, I haven't been paying attention, but um, I do know what happened at the grand final. Um, can you can you tell me what happened? <laughs> That's the question for you, actually. <laughs> from a young fella called Oscar Reed. Um, he wants to know what undid us. I don't think he's one of the players, um, <laughs> but he, apparently all the Swannies are all part of the family. They're all on the field with you. So, and he's actually suggested, was it the lack of a more senior leadership group or cohesion as a team? Yeah, it's a good question, Oscar. Thanks for that, mate. Um, <laughs> I know where he lives if you want to go and sort him out. Yeah, like, exactly. No, I don't. <laughs> so it's, it's been something that obviously I've been thinking about for the last 10 weeks since that day. And, um, you know, I've, I've been quite lucky enough to be able to play in four grand finals and to win two and now lose um, two. And um, I think you, we have to give a lot of credit to Hawthorne. Um, They're obviously still fuming after us beating them in 2012 when... They were um, raging favourites and this time around we were the favourites and I just feel that they really came out and they attacked us and they really got underneath our skin and um, that really rattled a, a few of our younger players and um, like um, Oscar said in the question, you know, our leaders didn't stand up either. So when our younger players get a little bit rattled and the leaders aren't showing the way, unfortunately... Um, we've known through history at our football club then cl clubs can really get a hold of us and Hawthorne did, unfortunately, on the biggest stage in AFL in front of millions of people and 100,000 people there. So there hasn't been a day that's gone past in, in my off-season where I haven't thought about it. Um, what it has done for me is motivate me more and want to get back there again to, to do something about it because, unfortunately, all that people will remember is the last time we played in the grand final. And... It's up to us now as a group to do something about that this year and um, that's the challenge for our group going forward. So um, I'm back at training on Monday. The, the young players have been back for a couple of weeks. So um, it will be nice to get back in that surrounding and, and, and start driving the players again. Mm. Well, I, I don't think anyone loves you less for that. There's uh, all the questions. <laughs> You're still a champion. Were you... Uh, did you take any comfort from uh, the Bunnies winning their grand final? <laughs> I, or you um, go for the bunnies? Or yeah, I think any time where you see a team that um, you know, hasn't won a <laughs> premiership in a long time there, um, you know, you, you, feel, you, feel sorry, you feel sorry for Michael. them because you really want them to have that success because we, we were not long ago, um, in 2005, our poor supporters, South Melbourne slash Sydney, have waited 72 years for us to win that mm. premiership. So... Um, for, for, for us to give that back to our supporters and the people that have supported us through thick and thin and through a, a journey up to Sydney when South Melbourne had to move, um, you really want to reward that. So for South Sydney supporters who have been so loyal over the so many different changes of what have happened at the football club, you know, you, you do have to take your hat off to the players and, and the people at South Sydney for getting that victory because it meant so much to, to so many people um, here in Sydney. Mm, it was. It was huge. I live in Redfern and... Yeah, it was, it was going off. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so another sport question. This one comes from Anne Loxley. And she says, I've heard Goodsy, because the familiarity, Goodsy, um, has a bath in ice at half time. Can you ask if it's true? And if so, what it does for you? So do you? Yeah, so um, 
in my first couple of years of playing as the Swans, um, I was playing really good first halves, and then the second half I was not performing too well. And so I um, went to the AIS in Canberra and saw a um, dietitian, a recovery specialist, and um, the thing for me, it was all mental. So what I was doing in the past was just running out in the same uniform I was wearing for the first half. So we changed it up. I'd have a shower. I'd do a five-minute ice bath. I'd put fresh socks on, uh, fresh shorts and jumper. So it felt like I was going out there for the start of the game again. Oh. So it was just that little mental trick. Um, and I was only young, so I was 21. And that seemed to really work for me. And um, yeah, it's something that I continue to do now. So the ice bath is about 11 degrees. So sitting in there at half time Ooh. can be quite um, hard to do. But I do enjoy running out in that second half because I definitely feel like um, you know, I'm about to start the game again, which is good. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, uh, I've heard of the ice bucket challenge, but I didn't know there was a... <laughs> You'd be wanting to get a pay rise if you have to take an ice bath every... I should was thinking when you were talking that it should have done that with uh, my daughter at school. Maybe she needs an ice bath in between <laughs> lessons to get her going. <laughs> Tip a bucket of ice over her head. Um, this one is from Kerry McIlvaney, and she wants to know, besides footy, what other personal interest uh, do you have or are you passionate about? Like, how you a singer, a bit of an artist, a <laughs> <laughs> bit of a dancer? Any hidden talents there that we don't know about? Um, I think my biggest hidden talent I've already told you about is my jigsaw puzzles. Oh, but yes. <laughs> I, think, I think what I like to do, um, my home's a bit of a sanctuary. Um, I don't have any swans memorabilia up in my house. Um, so when I walk in that door, I know it's time to switch off um, I try and stay off my computer when I get home. Don't need to check emails then. I have certain times of the week when I get on there and get that business done. So to, to have that sanctuary at home, to be able to mentally switch off is really important for me. But I think the one thing that I love doing is jumping in the ocean every day. Um, just getting in that water, washing away all those worries. Um, it's a really spiritual thing for me to get in that water every day. So um, yeah, it's something that I enjoy. and. I'm going to be swing, swimming the Bondi to Bronte swim in a couple of weeks. Are you? Oh. <coughs> yeah, 2.2 kilometres. So, yeah, I'm in training for it. It's not going too well. <laughs> <coughs> and, and all those great white uh, sightings say. at Bondi haven't helped the, uh, the enthusiasm yes, too much yeah, either. Yeah. Shark versus a swan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may want wings, actually, at, at a point in the... Yeah, no, it's... Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that, as you say, that dividing, compartmentalising <laughs> your, you know, private life and your public life, I guess, and that's something that... So it's really worked for you, has it? Yeah, you have to, um, I think, because uh, it's hard to be on all the time. Mm. Um, and it's hard to do it on the football field, on the football, in training all the time. It's hard to do it, but you have a certain standard that you want to be at. And for me to be at that standard, I know I need to switch off. So um, to be able to meditate and, and to be able to completely slow down um, has definitely helped me um, in the last 10 years and um, you know to be able to put my different hats on at different times um, definitely helps me also with balance so it's definitely something that I've learnt to get to this stage it hasn't been easy because there have been times when football pulls me too hard this way or my foundation pulls me too hard that way so um, you know getting that balance right is really important um, for my well-being and for getting the best out of me as well. Mm. Well, if you need a good jigsaw puzzle, <laughs> I've got a very good one. I bought it in New Zealand, speaking of New Zealand, of, of Baby George. Ooh. Highlight Baby Prince George. <laughs> Highlights in the, <laughs> his life to date. So I'll pass that one on to Thanks. you for Christmas. <laughs> um, but what about the architecture? You, you said you wanted to... So, I mean, I know Michael's looking for an, a good architect. Um, <laughs> put your hand up for that gig. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, um, my dreams of being an architect um, were sort of squashed when I went to an architecture firm in Year 10 uh, for work experience. Um, I spent two weeks there, which was I thought was going to be a great experience. It's going to really motivate me to get the grades I need to be an architect. But I learnt how to um, do the mail. Yes. I learnt how to photocopy. Photocopy, yeah. Um, yep. I learnt how to lick stamps and put them yeah. on the mail. Um, <laughs> So unfortunately, they didn't really help with that motivation um, to get me there. <coughs> but I still love architecture. Um, I designed some new plans um, for the 
my house in Kensington, which I'm really excited about. But um, for me, it's, it's definitely something that I just enjoy from afar now. Mm. Oh, well, I'm sure there'd be plenty of firms that'd be willing to um, <laughs> give you a go and it won't involve stamps or anything like that. <laughs> um, so I think we've probably, we've gone over time, I think. Um, so just the one last question, which I think is probably one that everyone wants to know is, have you started writing your autobiography? I know you're, you're, yeah. you're still a young man. But are you thinking about doing something like that? That's a good question, actually. I've been in the process of doing it for the last two years. Um, we obviously won't release it until I retire, so um, hopefully that's in a few more years. When, we'll when wait and see. When you're 60 or something? Yeah, when I'm 60 <laughs> or something. But um, no, I'm definitely, um, that process has been underway. It's a long way down the track. It's a, it's a really great process to go through, actually, to, to relive some of those memories of your childhood and stuff that you've forgotten about, but your friends and your family have remembered. And um, it's, 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 yeah, something that I'm looking forward to being able to share with everyone as well. Oh, well, that's, that's wonderful news, isn't it, everybody? Next couple of years, Christmas time, we all know what we're going to buy, <laughs> apart from Baby George Jigsaw Puzzles. <laughs> we're getting the, um, the autobiography. Well, if I could close then... Um, by asking you if we could please launch it at Corroboree Sydney. Uh, <laughs> put in a personal plug. But um, I just want to thank you. On behalf of all of us here, I think we all feel so privileged to spend this time with you. And you're a legend. Thank you very much. Thank you.